All right, well, uh, I'm Dr. David Perusek, Associate Professor of Anthropology on the campus and Chair of the May 4th, 50th Anniversary Committee here on the Ashley Buick campus. I'd like to welcome all of you who are here, and I would like to thank some people, including Dean Stalker, Amy Thomas, and Dylan Tyler, who've been so helpful over in the library. And I'd like to acknowledge other members of the committee, uh, Dr. Kiefer, who will also be speaking, uh, Dr. Brian Jones, Tamara Curry, Natalie Huya, who we want to talk about some more at the end of the program tonight, who is going to play a very important role in our year-long commemoration events. And I uh, also want to thank uh, Rebecca Harvey, uh, the Dean's Secretary, who's been extremely helpful. And I want to thank Andrew Lu Luoma uh, in IT. And I hope I haven't forgotten anybody. Uh, welcome, uh, did mention Tamara, I think. Yes, I did. And I uh, want to welcome uh, the other members of the faculty who are here and all of our students and community members as well. It's nearly 50 years now since the war in Vietnam, then newly expanded to neighboring neutral Cambodia, came home to the United States on Monday, May 4th in Kent, Ohio, on the campus of Kent State University. <coughs> on that sunny spring day at 12.24 p.m., about a dozen members of Troop G of the Ohio National Guard simultaneously turned 180 degrees around, aimed their bayoneted M1 rifles, and fired into a crowd of unarmed students. Thirteen long seconds and 67 shots later, 13 Kent State students lay wounded, dead, or dying. It was in every way and by every measure a massacre, and so it is known to history, and so it is called all over the world. It was a massacre that even Richard Nixon's Presidential Commission on Campus Unrest, the Scranton Commission, called unnecessary, unwarranted, and inexcusable. The students in the crosshairs that day included active anti-war demonstrators and other students outraged by and protesting the Army tanks, jeeps, and armed soldiers that had militarized their campus, together with lunchtime onlookers and students going and coming to and from classes. Among those wounded by guardsmen's bullets were Joseph Lewis, John Cleary, Thomas Grace, Alan Camphora, Douglas Rentmore, James Russell, Robert Stamps, Donald McKenzie, and Dean Kaler. Kaler was struck in the spinal cord while lying on the ground at a distance of 300 feet from his shooter. He remains paralyzed from the waist down. Mackenzie was struck from a distance of no less than 730 feet. Allison Krauss was there too. That's her over in the corner there. Born and raised in Cleveland Heights, she graduated from John F. Kennedy High School in Silver Springs, Maryland, after a family moved to that area. She was a freshman honor student at Kent, majoring in special education and planning to devote her life to developmentally disabled children. She had turned 19 11 days earlier. Passionately anti-war, Allison was part of the May 4th demonstration. A day earlier, on Sunday, May 3rd, 
while walking through campus with her boyfriend, she witnessed a National Guard officer removing a lilac from the rifle barrel of a soldier and berating the soldier for its having been there in the first place. What's the matter with peace, she called after him. Flowers are better than bullets. At 1224 on May 4th, a guardsman's bullet fired from a rifle 330 feet from where she stood went through Allison's left arm and entered the left side of her chest, fragmenting on impact and causing massive internal trauma. She died in the back of an ambulance. In a cemetery near Pittsburgh where her family had settled, the words, flowers are better than bullets, are inscribed on her gravestone. Sandra Scheuer was there in the crosshairs too, also a KSU honor student. She grew up in the Youngstown area and was a graduate of Boardman High School. Known for her compassion, her broad smile, her easygoing manner, and for the passion she brought to her major in speech therapy, Sandy was not overtly political. She did not take part in the demonstration, but was walking to her next class as per instruction to students from then university president Robert White to attend classes as usual that day. A guardsman's bullet through the neck severed her jugular vein and she bled out right where she fell in about five minutes time. Sandy was 390 feet away from the guardsman who shot her. Like two of the other fallen students, Sandy was Jewish and is buried in the Jewish cemetery in Canfield, Ohio. Her father, Martin, was a Holocaust survivor who fled Nazi Germany in search of freedom and democracy in the US. May 4th was also Sandy's parents' wedding anniversary and her card to them arrived in the mail later that day. Jeffrey Miller was also there. It is the photograph of his lifeless body, face down, a stream of blood flowing from his head, his out, the outstretched arms and anguished face of Marianne Vecchio kneeling next to him that so swiftly became the iconic image of May 4th. Jeff was passionately opposed to the war in Vietnam and had been acting, active in the demonstration that day. He'd been seen earlier both giving soldiers the middle finger and throwing a tear gas canister back at a group of them from a distance of about 200 feet. Only four months earlier, Jeff had transferred from Kent to Kent from Michigan State University where he had been an anti-war activist and a member of a fraternity. He'd written anti-war poems in high school, including one about an Ohio farm boy dying in Vietnam. In the fourth grade, Jeff had contacted Ebony Magazine to request information on racism because he wanted to write about the plight of black people in America. His mother came to know of this when a staff member from Ebony assuming Jeff was himself black, called her to commend her on his fine upbringing and to assure her that he was bound to be a leader in the black community one day. On the morning of May 4th, 1970, Jeff called his mother and told her he was planning to attend a rally on campus against the expansion of the war into Cambodia. Don't worry, Mom, he told her. I may get arrested, but I won't get my head busted. At 1224, a single bullet entered his open mouth and exited his posterior skull, killing him instantly. He was 265 feet away from his killers. A native of Long Island, Jeff is buried in Westchester County, New York. I just happened to know he was a huge Mets fan. 
And then there's Bill Schroeder. He was there and in the line of fire too. Bill Schroeder, Eagle Scout, accomplished amateur photographer, psychology major at Kent, and former basketball standout at Lorraine High School, my high school. Bill worried a great deal about the war and its purposes, but he was a spectator on May 4th, on his way to class following a visit with his ROTC advisor, when a single shot from an M1 rifle entered the left side of his chest at the seventh rib, piercing his lung as fragments from it exited through his shoulder. Bill was 382 feet away from his executioner, lying face down on the ground and facing away from the guard when he was struck. He died on the operating table and is buried just outside the Lorraine city limits in a cemetery in Amherst, Ohio. I will talk more tonight about Allison, Jeff, Sandy, and Bill, about the immediate aftermath and enduring legacy of May 4th at Kent State in the U.S. and beyond. And I'll have more to say about our year-long series of commemorative events. But for my, now, my job is to turn things over to my colleague, Dr. Bradley Kiefer, Associate Professor of History on our campus. Dr. Kiefer will take us through the chronology of events as they unfolded in Kent from the evening of April 30th, 1970 to those deadly 13 seconds that commenced at 1224 on May 4th. Dr. Kiefer. Watch the professor use technology. Good evening, and thank you all for being here. It, it is uh, my task as a historian to, to go through the chronology, and I, I grew up with May 4th, uh, like most of us of, of my generation, uh, us sort of late baby boomers. Uh, I was in eighth grade, seventh or eighth grade in 1970, um, so all of this happened. I was in Jackson Township, Stark County, Ohio, um, close enough for it to resonate too far away to really understand. <laughs> Students who know me know that I generally don't jump into a, to a topic without some sort of background. This is not a long background, but it does speak to the context uh, in which the May 4th events happen. The 60s were uh, a, a tumultuous uh, era uh, marked by a several really significant uh, social and political reforms. Uh, the civil rights movement, the anti-war and anti-draft movement, and then what became defined as the counterculture, which was the youth activist movement, um, both social and, and cultural. Uh, this is 1964, a bus uh, uh, from the Freedom Riders, a civil rights group uh, going into the South, attempting to uh, promote the, the Civil Rights Act that had recently been passed, uh, assure voting rights for African Americans, and they were met with a considerable amount of hostility and violence. Demonstrations had become the norm by 1965. This is a giant uh, demonstration for uh, free speech in Berkeley uh, on the West Coast. Berkeley had been one of those colleges that had spawned a great many uh, activists. Uh, 1968, of course, a year that's marked by a, a number of traumatic events. Um, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., the civil rights leader, the assassination of Robert Kennedy, um, who was a, a senator and candidate uh, for the presidential nomination uh, for, for uh, uh, 1968 election. Uh, followed by the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, where the forces of law and order uh, and the, uh, the forces of activism and protest met in a highly televised and extremely uh, violent uh, set of, of events. Uh, and so one can see this, the, the, the sort of escalation of violence uh, of between the establishment, if you will, uh, and the, the protesters. 
This is my own edition of the war coming home in 1969. Vietnamization was the plan that President Richard Nixon introduced. It was one of the things that got him elected in 1968. And the idea was is that we would withdraw American soldiers gradually, turning the war over to South Vietnam. Um, this plan was put into effect, and soldiers were being withdrawn. Unfortunately, it meant that the soldiers left behind were vulnerable to, to a lot more violence. And most people uh, have not met Sharon Lane. Uh, I, I did early. Uh, in my uh, uh, graduate school career. Uh, Sharon was a nurse, which I think is near and dear to the hearts of people here. Uh, the only army nurse uh, killed, female army nurse killed by enemy fire in Vietnam. The war was already coming home. It just comes home a lot harder and faster in 1970. Woodstock was the great hope, and I call 1969 the forlorn hope, because people thought the war would be coming to an end and that peace, love, harmony, and grooviness would prevail. And of course, it doesn't. Uh, this is the only text in my PowerPoint, uh, and I'm not going to read it to you because that makes people crazy. <laughs> but notice there are a number of factors, and that last element, the element of fear, distrust, uh, the, the, the polarization of the sides, much of it generational, but clearly, there are some strong feelings on both sides about what is considered appropriate, what's considered patriotic, what's considered American and un-American, and it are those factors that sort of fuel uh, the, the events uh, on the weekend of May 4th, and, and, and don't justify, but help explain why it went so off. This is the only picture of Richard Nixon you'll have to look at in this presentation, fortunately. This is President Nixon on television explaining why United States forces were supporting South Vietnamese troops going into Cambodia to quash enemy activity that was seen to be dangerous uh, to the well-being of, of allied forces in Vietnam. And most people had no idea this operation was going to take place. And again, the role of television in all of this can't be ignored. Television is, as we know social media to be today, is the fuel uh, that feeds a lot of people's reactions to events. And Nixon's announcement was a bombshell to those anti-war uh, activists who believed that they were really on the, on the right side of this thing coming to an end. Uh, this is a group of students uh, at a demonstration on, at noon on Friday, May 1st, on the Kent campus. This is the Victory Bell. Um, it's on the Commons, it's still there. Uh, and this demonstration was called to bury a copy of the Constitution since they believed that, that the continuation of hostilities in Cambodia were a violation. And so uh, a number of people uh, 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 attended this. Uh, it was a peaceful uh, demonstration. And they called for another meeting, another demonstration for noon on May 4th. And I think this is one of those occasions where the circumstances change pretty drastically between noon on Friday and noon on Monday, notwithstanding uh, that uh, maybe the demonstration at noon on Monday would, would be even more necessary. That night, Friday night, uh, a riot broke out in downtown Kent, largely and completely unrelated to the anti-war movement or anything political. This was drunks misbehaving, um, it got into the streets, it escalated as such things tend to do, things caught fire, um, and there were some pretty scary moments in which uh, residents of Kent, the mayor of Kent, and other people believed that, that essentially anarchy had come to town. Chaos had arrived, uh, and they panicked. And called the National Guard. Now the Ohio National Guard unit that shows up after dark on May Second, uh, had been deployed uh, dealing with a, with a mining strike, a coal strike, uh, in southern Ohio, and were essentially coming off of a pretty tense and long stretch of active duty. Uh, and so they come in pretty much fully loaded um, for some sort of violent confrontation, expecting, of course, based on the reports, that they were going to confront seriously unruly and dangerous mobs. What they find is the ROTC building, a wooden building uh, on the west end of the commons on the Kent campus on fire. Uh, 
Uh, it had been set on fire by persons or person unknown, um, and it was burning quite happily by the time the National Guard uh, arrived. Again, if you're looking for a sign that you're entering into a dangerous and volatile situation, a burning building in the middle of the college campus would seem to indicate that your, your presence was required. So another kind of circumstance that, that feeds the escalation of this, of this weekend. Um, you can see the aftermath and now the occupation of the campus uh, by the Ohio National Guard. Uh, now these troops again are in, in uh, you know, modern combat gear, carrying M1 rifles. Um, they are relatively at ease and the daytime on May 3rd was not a particularly tense one, though the presence of armed vehicles, um, uh, guys with guns, uh, and armored uh, personnel carriers in the parking lot of the Music and Speech Building would tend to indicate that things were not normal. Uh, but there wasn't any uh, violence or, or any significant confrontations during the day on May 3rd. After dark, things got a little tense, and by 11 o'clock, uh, a large group of, of, of people, students mostly and activists, had met on the corner of Main Street and Lincoln uh, to, to want to negotiate with the leaders of the National Guard um, and try to get them off the campus. And, and the, so the focus of the activists' uh, frustration was less about the war in Cambodia, still a significant problem to people who were involved and, and engaged, but now it's having the army on campus, which seemed outrageous and unnecessary because it was outrageous and unnecessary. The authorities, and by authorities we mean the, the, the National Guard, the governor, the mayor, uh, the Ohio State Patrol, had all declared that there should be no demonstration at noon on campus. Uh, that word didn't necessarily get out to everyone, uh, but it seems pretty clear that the people who were going to meet anyhow now had an even bigger thing to demonstrate about, and that was the fact that the Army was still on their campus. Oddly, as Dr. Prusik pointed out, the university didn't cancel classes. So we have this bizarre juxtaposition of trying to retain the semblance of normalcy when there was nothing normal going on. Right? That, that's not normal. So here we have sort of a long distance view from the perspective of the students on the hill next to Taylor Hall. And you'll see this view from the opposite direction. Um, looking at the guard formation that you see here is not going to be used in any sort of combat against an armed enemy. Uh, those tactics went out in, in the First World War. Uh, these are crowd control tactics where you have long lines of, of troops or law enforcement uh, and you're going to try to move the crowd. Uh, the jeep containing the National Guard commander uh, and other officials drove out into the commons with a megaphone and read the riot act, which was essentially order to disperse that the demonstration was illegal, that anybody still left behind was in violation of the law and would be arrested. Uh, and the jeep circled, and you can see um, a, a large number of spectators who are not even demonstrating, they're just watching. Um, these were along the tennis courts uh, facing, uh, facing to the north. Tear gas um, is launched from the as the guard begins. So the, the, the idea is is that the tear gas goes out ahead of the advancing troops, dispersing the crowd, which of course is not gonna stand too long in tear gas, it's terrible stuff. The guard will be wearing gas masks to protect themselves from the tear gas. Here's from the perspective of the guard, that's Taylor Hall in the background. Um, you can see the people who had been assembled by the, the Victory Bell, and the Victory Bell uh, would have been right behind the, this line of guardsmen out of sight um, they're retreating. This is, this is not a, a, a confrontational mob. This is a mob doing the, the smart thing, which is getting out of the way of the soldiers uh, with guns and tear gas. Um, someone, I'm not sure it's, it's, uh, it's Jeff, but someone throws one of the tear gas canisters back. That is all that constitutes resistance during this confrontation, is the occasional hurling back of the tear gas canister. And during a lull, 
which according to the timestamp, and by the way, Amy, all the credits for these photographs are located in the notes section of the PowerPoint, because uh, I can see Amy going, he doesn't have any credits. <laughs> and they're all there, Amy, it's all covered. But that, notice the body language of the crowd. It's, they're not particularly hostile, they're not particularly panicked, they're just sort of amazed at the spectacle in front of them as, as these troops advance up the hill through the, through the cloud of tear gas in battle formation. Bayonet's fixed. Bayonet is a, sh is a, a knife that makes a firearm a sharp pointed stick. Um, and if you're going to move people along without being as lethal as bullets, you use bayonets. But for the most part, bayonet is a sign to keep moving and get out of the way. Another perspective from roughly the same point. Notice the guard is successfully pushing the crowd up and around Taylor Hall. A formidable line of armed military men. And again, you've seen the crowd they're confronting. Not a particularly formidable enemy. The crowd is completely gone. They've all dropped down the back side of the hill on, on the uh, east side of Taylor Hall. And so the guard has little to do but but go over the crest of the hill. There has to be a map, thanks to the KSU archives for providing one. Um, the, the long forgotten Company C goes around the other side of Taylor Hall um, and are largely left out of the narrative and, and play no role in the shoot. Troops uh, A and uh, G are going to come up along the crest. So just before that you go, there's the crest of the hill where you can see no people in the last slide, in the middle of the button. Ah. Oh, that went badly. That went badly. All right, never mind. So there's the top one. Okay. Technology. <laughs> right, there's the crest of the hill in the last picture. Totally clear. Guard comes up. Now they're going to push that group down the baseball, football, soccer practice field, which is generally known as the pra practice field. Where inexplicably, several of the guardsmen, notice the formation has, has loosened some, right? They're not in that tight line formation. The crowd is dispersed. They don't even have a clear sort of target group. Uh, but several of these soldiers kneel and aim. And this is one of those moments where nobody's quite sure what why they were kneeling and aiming, or what they were kneeling and aiming at, other than this photographer, who clearly has to be having a moment of, of why am I here? <laughs> uh, the the flag-waving individual seems to, to be the obvious target, but notice that his, his gestures are not necessarily threatening, they're just defiant. Brad, that's Alan and that's Alan Canfora, who is going to get shot up on the hill. So he's, he's, made, he's made himself noticed. And oddly enough, there are no pictures that I could find, and, and I looked through a lot of the special collection of, of the guard going into the practice field. This is a picture of them marching out of the practice field, back up towards the hill. So again, and I, I chose carefully because I knew how long I'd talk and I only had so much time. Right? And again, notice the body language of the spectators. Curiosity at best. This is one of the more infamous photographs this one taken literally from the balcony of Taylor Hall, uh, right next to the guard, as they turned and fired back into uh, the Prentice Hall parking lot. So if we go back, right, notice they came from this direction, they're firing back this way at, at people who had sort of gathered on what had been the fringe of the action just a few minutes ago. The action was down here. These people fringe. And suddenly, they're in the fire. The natural reaction is, get out of the way. And as Dr. Prusik told you, several of these people were hit laying down, which de demonstrates that, that the firing was, in many cases, rather random. Um, the distances, the, the M1 Grand has a, an effective distance of, of a considerable length. 400 feet is nothing. These are combat weapons favored in World War II Korean conflict. 
So people ducking and cover. Uh, this is uh, a Cleary who was wounded. Uh, this is a Pulitzer Prize winning picture uh, of him being tended to by people on the spot. I mean, people got up from the firing. Guard is literally gonna turn around and march off the field. There's a picture of him here in a minute. Uh, and people rush to the aid of the, of the wounded and dying. Uh, there is no advance. There's really no follow-up to these shots other than dead silence and a lot of people yelling. Um, one body uh, in the, the driveway, uh, Dean Kaler is in this crowd of people right here. Uh, and again, the, the firing position from the guard is just sort of up the hill. There's the practice field way down there. And that's Jeff Miller. And that's Jeff Miller laying in the, in the driveway. He's, he's deceased. And again, this is very quick, shortly after the, pick, after the shots were fired. already seen this photograph again as as people react and now the body language of people is just stunned just dumbfounded because nobody can believe what had just happened because there was no indication that they were going to get shot at there's the guard coming back down the Taylor Hall Hill and again uh, the, the, the looks on the faces of the sort of group, they're, they're, are just, they're just kind of stunned. Uh, they're walking ahead of this guard unit that's now coming back down the hill to go back to where they started from after having just done something uh, so inexplicably uh, horrific. Uh, this is Glenn Frank, he, he was a, a geography professor at Kent, he was one of the faculty marshals. Um, there were people angry. There were, act, there were demonstrators who were angry and they were ready to go after the guard. They were ready to go and hurl themselves at these guys um, in vengeance and Glenn Frank and a number of other faculty members um, seriously negotiated with both the guard and the, and the student activists to, to, to just stop. Um, he was sure that the guard would kill more. The guard indicated they would, uh, even though they offered no explanations for having done what they just did. And so Glenn Frank is important. You can see Jeff Miller's blood running down the sidewalk as he's talking. This is a very interesting picture, and I couldn't resist adding it. Not sure what you describe this as. Anger, frustration, um, this guy with his flag jumping in that puddle of blood. Um, and then cooler heads prevail. Uh, you can see uh, Dr. Frank there. Uh, this looks to be another faculty member sullen, angry group of young people um, who've just seen something they had no idea uh, they were gonna see and experience something they had no idea they were gonna experience. I thought this was sort of an evocative picture. Um, you know, Kent Week was a sort of celebratory beginning uh, or end of the, the, the spring term um, and there was the list of activities with a big chunk torn out of it and a lot of army vehicles in the background, right? That they're just going to shut down the campus, send up a, a guy around with a megaphone and say, go home, school is closed. Um, Dr. Prusik, I think, will probably tell you a little bit about the aftermath of that in terms of how students were graduating and how people got things done. And, and, and it's pretty amazing, and it involved regional campuses, by the way, uh, and faculty members uh, who essentially took it upon themselves to get their students done with the quarter. We are on the quarter system then, by the way, folks. Um, there's a VW with a lot of bullet holes in it in the Prentice Hall parking lot. Explain that to your insurance company. <laughs> and, and this last picture, I, I don't know. Um, the photographer's note uh, on the credit just says, I don't know who this girl was, but she stood there for the longest time just staring at, at that puddle of Jeff Miller's blood. And, and what a sort of I, a, a, a very poignant moment was essentially a pretty genuine attempt to do things right and get things right. Uh, and this young woman just sort of taken, taken aback by it all. Uh, the familiar uh, faces of the, of the four. 
I've always tried to make it a policy, and this doesn't make me anything other than a responsible character to mention their names every time May 4th rolls around. And every time I visit the camp and I go up and visit uh, the spots that are marked where they fell, it just seems like something uh, that should be done. I encourage all of you to go to the May 4th Visitor Center when you get a chance. Um, it's the, 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 the grounds are marked. Dr. Prusik will talk about the process that got it that far. It took most of the 50 years. That is, uh, that is all of my presentation. I hope that gives you a clearer picture of, of what happened. Um, and I will turn things back over to Dr. Prusik. Thanks, Brad. Nicely done. By the spring of 1970, Richard Nixon, who'd been elected president in part for his promise to end the war in Vietnam with his secret plan to do so, had begun calling student protesters bums and characterizing them as burners of buildings and books and claiming they were out to destroy higher education in America. His vice president, Spiro Agnew, carried that message forward in an April 1970 assertion when he offered, and I quote, one modest suggestion for my friends in the academic community. The next time a mob of students waving their nonviolent demands start pitching bricks and rocks at the student union, just imagine they're wearing brown shirts or white sheets and act accordingly. Close quote. Across the country on April 7th, California Governor Ronald Reagan declared, quote, if it takes a bloodbath, let's get it over with. No more appeasement. On Sunday, May 3rd, in a speech in front of the fire station in Kent, Ohio, Reagan's Ohio counterpart, Governor James Rhodes, declared of student protesters that, and again I quote, they're worse than the brown shirts and the communist element, and also the Knight Riders and the vigilante. They're the worst type of people we harbor in America. I think we're up against the strongest, well-trained, militant, revolutionary group that has ever been assembled in America. We're going to treat the problem. We're not going to treat the symptoms." Close quote. And at noon on May 4th, 1970, on the campus of Kent State University, just minutes before the gunfire, Brigadier General Robert Canterbury declared that, quote, these students are going to have to find out what law and order is all about, close quote. And so they did, and so I think did we all. To this day, no one has spent a day in jail or taken responsibility or otherwise been held accountable for the violence inflicted on unarmed students at Kent State. From the Portage County Grand Juries that indicted 25 students against whom charges were eventually dismissed, but ruled that guardsmen were not subject to criminal prosecution under the laws of the state of Ohio, to the federal judge who despite the federal indictment of eight guardsmen charged with willfully depriving the dead and wounded of their civil rights, acquitted the guardsmen mid-trial without letting the case go to the jury. The courts proved to be sites more of degradation than of justice for victims and their families. Finally, in 1978, families of the May 4th victims accepted an out-of-court settlement of $675,000 in damages from the state of Ohio, along with a statement of regret signed by Governor Rhodes, General Canterbury, and members of the Guard. There is no admission of guilt or even a discernible apology in the statement, but a major motivation for the settlement was to obtain financial support for Dean Kaler, who you'll recall is paralyzed from the waist down and living his life in a wheelchair. 
On college campuses across the country in May of 1970, the response to what people elsewhere call and still call Kent State was swift, dramatic, and pervasive. Campus demonstrations broke out at the rate of 100 per day between May 4th and May 8th. On strike, shut it down. On strike, shut it down. Became the battle cry of a national student strike, the first in the history of the United States. By May 15th, demonstrations involved 1,350 colleges and universities and nearly 5 million students. Between 500 and 600 schools were shut down completely, at least 50 of them for the remainder of the year. They can't kill us all, declared a banner, draped from a dormitory window at New York University. On Wall Street on May 8th, a demonstration against the war and in tribute to the fallen at Kent was attacked by 200 pipe-wielding, fist-swinging, hard-hat-working construction workers. On that same day at the University of New Mexico, nine students were bayoneted by members of the New Mexico National Guard. Precisely because of Kent State, however, those guardsmen, at least, had no ammunition in their rifles and guns. Not so for the members of the Mississippi Highway Patrol who shot and killed three students and wounded 12 others at Jackson State College on May 14th, on the evening of May 14th. The students killed there at the historically black college in the state capitol were Philip Gibbs, a Jackson State junior, and James Earl Green, a senior at nearby Jim Hill High School. Pages sticking together. On Saturday, May 9th, 100,000 people turned out for a hastily called demonstration in Washington, D.C. to protest the Kent State killings together with the invasion of Cambodia and the ongoing war. According to Nixon's Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, and I quote, Washington took on a character of a besieged city. A pinnacle of mass public protest was reached. Police surrounded the White House a ring of buses was used to shield the grounds of the president home, president's home. The tidal wave of media and student criticism powerfully affected the Congress. The very fabric of government was falling apart. The executive branch was shell-shocked. After all, their children and their friends' children took part in the demonstrations. The president saw himself as the firm rock in this rushing stream but the turmoil had its effect on him as well. Pretending indifference, he was deeply wounded. Nixon reached a point of exhaustion that caused his advisors deep concern. Henry Kissinger, the White House years. According to Nixon's chief of staff and eventual Watergate co-conspirator, H.R. Haldeman, quote, Kent State, in May 1970, marked a turning point for Nixon, a beginning of his downhill slide toward Watergate. None of us realized it then. We were all too busy trying to calm nationwide furor over the Cambodian invasion. H.R. Haldeman, The End of Power, Ends of Power. And in his own memoir, Richard Milhouse Nixon would eventually write that, quote, those days after Kent State were the darkest days of my presidency, close quote. And so, if anyone thought the 13 seconds of gunfire that rained down from next to the pagoda atop Blanket Hill on May 4th was going to put a stop to campus demonstrations, they themselves were demonstrably wrong. Not only in terms of the national student strike and the indignation that motivated it, but in still broader and more consequential ways as well.
The deaths at Kent State served to radicalize more students and young people than ever before, well beyond those first days and weeks. And as the enormity of what had occurred gradually took hold across generations, sentiment against the war galvanized for those already solidly opposed to it, grew by leaps and bounds among the war's milder critics, and took root in segments of the population who had theretofore supported the war. In the words of wounded student Tom Grace, quote, the politics of protest grew to such magnitude that the system was compelled to respond or face further measures, close quote. And indeed, two U.S. senators co-sponsored an amendment that would require Nixon to withdraw U.S. forces from Cambodia within two months, which he did do. In 1973, in its final form, the Cooper Church Amendment was passed as the War Powers Act and, to quote Gate Grace again, quote, became the first time during the Vietnam experience that Congress acted to restrict a president's ability to wage undeclared war. To this day, the War Powers Act remains a vital, if regularly unused, instrument of peace and congressional power in a system of checks and balances between branches of government. May 4th at Kent State turned out to be a watershed event in U.S. history, an iconic social, cultural, and political moment that has reverberated throughout the country and the world to this day, from Kent, Ohio, to Washington, D.C., to Tiananmen Square, to Hong Kong in 2019. It has spawned poetry and music on every continent save Antarctica, and who knows, maybe even there. There are dozens of books about it, as well as documentaries, docudramas, movies, plays, short stories, a novel or two, and a full-length opera. And there are songs about May 4th, lots and lots of songs by artists as divergent as the Steve Miller Band, Bruce Springsteen, the Beach Boys, Dave Brubeck, the Isley Brothers, Magpie, and Genesis. The Crosby, Stills, Nash song, Ohio, written by Neil Young and released in May of 1970, is undoubtedly the most famous, but the list includes Hey Sandy by British singer-songwriter Harvey Andrews, and Holly Near's It Could Have Been Me, which has been an anthem of the May 4th movement at Kent ever since its release in 1974. Meanwhile, back at Kent State, the university had shut down immediately and remained closed for six weeks. Professors offered classes and exams in their own houses so students, graduating seniors especially, could complete necessary credits. Around 200 fleeing students and about 25 faculty members arrived at Oberlin College on May 12th to establish Kent in Exile. Others went together to Case Western Reserve, Antioch, and even Cleveland State. Many students who left Kent after the gunfire never returned. Many others found that the horrors of May 4th resulted in an extension of time to degree completion, in some cases by a year or three or four, in other cases they never finished. In the four years following May 4th, enrollment at Kent dropped by 13% as parents chose not to send their children to a college that either couldn't or wouldn't protect them from state violence or from being radicalized on campus, or both. The parents of the dead and wounded students learned of the shooting through news reports on radio and television, in phone calls from reporters, or from their children's KSU friends or roommates. 
Jeff Miller's mother, for instance, after learning of the shootings on the car radio while driving home from work, decided to call her son immediately upon arriving home. She did. A young man, Jeff's roommate, answered. When she asked to speak to Jeff, he paused and said, he's dead. Within hours, people across the country and the world had seen that image of her son's lifeless body on the ground, but no one from Kent State had contacted her or any of the other parents. Nor was there anyone from Kent State at the hospital to meet any of them, not in the ER, not outside of surgery, not in the lobbies or waiting rooms, nor at the morgue. I'll be bitter till the day I die, said Allison's mother repeatedly during the rest of her life. Would you not expect to see a university official at the hospital where you went to see your dead child to extend a hand to tell you what happened? They've never done that. Their letter of sympathy was a check, a refund made out to Allison for spring tuition. She wasn't around to cash it. And so began a decades-long relationship of the KSU administration to May 4th, comprised of denial, cruelty, and indifference. To state the case as charitably as possible, insensitivity became the rule of the day. But that rather awful relationship began to change with the administration of President Carol Cartwright in the 1990s. To her credit, Cartwright never missed a May 3rd candlelight vigil march during her entire years at the helm. And it was during the Cartwright administration that at long last in 1999, the places in the Taylor Hall parking lot where Sandy, Jeff, Allison, and Bill had fallen were finally cordoned off and properly marked following many years of pressure on the university to do so and it must be said with $100,000 of privately raised funds. Until then, for every day, for just less than 30 years, cars parked there, dripped fluids, and otherwise proclaimed the university's level of respect for the dead and the significance of May 4th. In 1975, after sponsoring four annual May 4th commemorative events, University officials decided that five years was long enough to mark the anniversary. Thereupon, the student group, the May 4th Task Force, was formed and took over the task of organizing annual commemorations, which it has done right up until now. The task force committed itself to ongoing educational programs about May 4th and to advocacy on behalf of the victims and their families. Again and again, I'm sorry to say, it had to fight with KSU officialdom for every nod to decency. Eliminating car parking where the four students had fallen was a victory. Naming buildings for them or canceling classes on May 4th was not. From time to time over the years, authors, researchers, artists, and participants in and around May 4th donated their documents and artifacts to other universities based on perceptions of KSU bureaucratic hostility. Most famous, perhaps, are the cases of Peter Davies, author of The Truth About Kent State, A Challenge to the American Conscience, whose personal papers reside in the Yale University archives in New Haven, and renowned sculptor George Siegel, whose Abraham and Isaac sculpture has resided at Princeton University since shortly after its creation in the late 1970s. Commissioned by the Mildred Andrews Foundation of Cleveland, the $150,000 sculpture was offered as a gift to KSU, but rejected by an administration that called it too violent. But not before a high-ranking official at the time suggested that a new version be made with, and I'm quoting, a nude or nearly nude co-ed enticing a soldier with her charms. Close quote, believe it or not. But the loudest, most monumental expression 
of official disregard began taking shape in late 1976 when KSU leaders made plans to build a massive gymnasium over a large part of the May 4th site. News of those plans came slowly to light in the winter and spring of 1977. And on May 4th of that year, 1,500 or so KSU students marched against construction of the gym, and a couple hundred of them occupied the administration, which was then in Rockwell Hall, until late into the night. A series of rallies and marches ensued. On May 12th, <clears throat> tents were pitched on Blanket Hill, just across the sidewalk from where members of Troop G had turned and fired. Tent City was born and became the physical base of a national and international outcry against the gym. People across the country and the world in the following days and weeks called for the gym site to be moved. Major public figures from politics, academia, sports, music, and film joined the public outcry. The occupation of Blanket Hill lasted for 62 days and remains the longest student occupation of university property in U.S. history. Tent City was dismantled on July 12th when 193 people, among them Sandy's parents, Martin and Sarah Scheuer, and Mr. and Mrs. Albert Canfora, were arrested and taken to jail. That's going to be a picture of me enjoying the end of a stroll with campus policemen as they transfer me into the custody of Portage County Sheriff's deputies for a free ride to the county jail courtesy of the university bus service. Bulldozers arrived the next morning and despite the objections of victims' families and continuing nationwide demands to move the gym, punctuated by protests on the campus, the gym went up, burying a large swath of history beneath it. The geographic distortion created by the imposition of the gym eliminated open spaces that were there in 1970 and boxed in the ridge of the hill from which the guardsmen had fired. In 1970, shooters claimed that they had been surrounded and were endangered. The FBI report released by the Justice Department states, and I quote, the guardsmen were not surrounded, and it also says, and I again quote, we have some reason to believe that the claim by National Guardsmen that their lives were in danger by the students was fab fabricated subsequent to the event. But the gym annex, as it's called, works in favor of the fabrication. As the gym went up in August of 1977, Cleveland Press columnist Don Robertson called it obscene and wrote that, I weep for those poor, sorry, stiff-necked establishment flats who run Kent State. They are wrong, they are wrong, they are indeed obscene. But I'm happy to say that that was then and this is now. Administrator, administrators and the regimes do come and go. And the variously callous, cruel, indifferent, and insensitive KSU regimes have at long last come and gone. On February, February 23, 2010, during the KSU presidency of Lester Lefton, the May 4th site was added to the National Register of Historic Places. A university-sponsored walking tour was added that same year in time for the 40th commemoration. And on October 22nd, 2012, that's seven years ago today, Kent State University opened the May 4th Visitor Center above the Commons on Blanket Hill in Taylor Hall, a building that had stood there in 1970 and around which so much had unfolded on May 4th. According to Laura Davis, the center's first director, who was a freshman in 1970 and witnessed the shootings, and who is now emeritus professor of English at Kent State, the center offers, and again I quote, 
a powerful and immersive experience that provides context and perspective on the tragedy and examines the lasting impact that still resonates today, close quote. According to the university, part of the center's $11 million design and construction costs were met by $667,000 raised from all 16 deans from every KSU campus and college. Thank you, Dean Stalker. Kent State appears to have turned a corner with regard to May 4th. What President Carol Cartwright leaned toward, President Beverly Warren leaned fully into, embracing May 4th, not only for its central place in Kent State history, or for the watershed event that it was and remains, but especially to honor those who lost their lives or were wounded, and to carry forward this university's commitment to open dialogue and civil discourse. In this 50th anniversary year, under the Warren and now Diacon administrations, Kent State has embarked upon a year-long program of education, exhibits, and presentations that will culminate on May 4th. Our session tonight is part of that and marks the first in a series of commemorative events on or sponsored by the Ashtabula campus. These include screenings of the documentary film, Fire in the Heartland, Kent State, May 4th, and Student Protest in America, by professor, filmmaker, and May 4th, 1970 witness, Daniel Miller. That film will be shown here in this room on Tuesday, November 19th, and also on Tuesday, February 18th, both showings at 7 p.m. right here. On March 12th, we'll do a program on the music of May 4th, also here in the auditorium at 7 o'clock. On April 8th, Dr. Roseanne Chick Canfora, a May 4th survivor and activist and student of a, a sister of a wounded student, who is also now adjunct professor of communication at Kent, will be here to present. And we'll take students from here to the May 4th Visitors Center and wounded student Alan Canfor will provide us with a guided tour of the May 4th site. That's on April 29th. On April 18th, on one or even more additional occasions, we'll put on a production of the play May 4th Voices with a cast of Kent State at Ashtabula students. It'll be directed by our colleague, Natalie Huya, and um, she's sitting up here with a green sweater and, can I say, purple looking shoes? They are. They are. That's, <laughs> that's our girl. Uh, if you or any of your friends might be interested in taking part in the play, either as an actor or in the production of the play or any of the many activities that will surround it, uh, please contact Natalie Huya uh, here on the campus. On April 23rd, our final session, or next to final session, I should say, uh, will be a session on conflict management that asks, what have we learned? And will be conducted by Karen Cunningham, former acting director of the School of Peace and Conflict Studies at Kent State. And then on Monday, May 4th, the actual anniversary, in 1970, it was a Monday as well, uh, we'll commemorate that day uh, with a live feed from the commons at Kent and possibly some other activities as well. Uh, we may indeed add additional events as the year unfolds. So I hope we'll see all of you at those. Before I end things tonight, let me say that Sandy, Jeff, Allison, and Bill obviously died prematurely, suddenly, and violently when they and I were young. I've learned a great deal from their lives and deaths since then. I've walked many of the same paths they walked, both literally and figuratively. And I've cared about many of the same things and even some of the same people that they cared about. By now and for a really long time now, 
those four young people have felt like old friends to me. In the early years after May 4th, my thoughts of them lingered upon the futures they would never have, the relationships they lost with people they loved and who loved them, the romantic partners and even the children that would never be, as well as the contributions they would never make, not only in the chosen fields, but who knows in what other areas of life. All losses to society and the world. But I am no longer young. And now when I look back upon those 50 years and the lives and early deaths of Anne, Allison, Sandy, Jeff, and Bill, it is through a different lens, the lens of old age. And through that lens, I see that of all the things that I got to do in this life and that they did not, it was being there for a dying father, being a comfort to my mother in her old age, and holding the hand of my younger brother as cancer took his life, it was these blessed moments that have mattered most to me. And it was moments like them that on top of all the others, soldiers' bullets eliminated for Sandy, Allison, Jeff, and Bill when the war came home to Kent State. And I continue to learn from May 4th. Thank you. possible to uh, go back to the photo of uh, the girl kneeling over Jeff Miller? Yes, that girl is uh, Marianne Vecchio. She was, a, uh, I think, a 14-year-old 14 14 runaway. Year old. I was, uh, gonna, I was just going to say weekend. that. She was a 14-year-old runaway yes, right. from Florida. Uh, Amy <coughs> she was not a Kent State student. And, no, she uh, wasn't. Uh, she was a troubled youth and uh, left home in Florida and hitchhiked on the freeway and got picked right. up by some young people. And, ended up in Youngstown, Ohio. And then on uh, Friday night, May 1st, 1970, they said, you want to come to Kent State because we're going to go party. And they brought her and just dropped her. And she didn't know a soul. But that girl was where all the action was, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. And almost as if fate had it, she was standing next to Jeff on May 4th. And she uh, went to ask him what his name was. And as he turned to answer, that's when he was shot through the face. So I've spoken to her um, over the years. Uh, at I Kent. met her a couple times as well. She had a very rough life after. Can you hear me? She had a very rough what, life. One other thing, too, uh, that um, I, I kind of want to mention here, that Governor Rhodes uh, on Sunday, he was really pissed because he was a law and order hard ass. And he's the one that called the guard out to the campus, but he had an ulterior motive because on Tuesday, May 5th, he was at a uh, Republican primary election for US Senate against Taft. And so he wanted to show the people of Ohio that he wanted law and order. And so that's why he called the guard out. One of the yeah, main th reasons. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And he lost the election the next day. So there is justice. Well, a little bit, yeah, right, thanks. Thank you. Hey, by the way, yo, thank you. And since you brought up Mary, who was, as you point out, a runaway, you know, uh, there were other people around too, including in the parking lot, uh, Chrissy Hind, who went on to become a uh, lead singer of Chrissy Hind and the Pretenders. And uh, Jerry Casale uh, was part of the demonstrations. Uh, if you're familiar with the band Devo, uh, that's Jerry Casale. Uh, he was like 15 feet away from Jeff Miller at the time of the shooting. Uh, there are all kinds of, as you sort of point out, there are fascinating footnotes to this stuff, yeah. A couple other things, too, real quick. Yeah. Sandy told your mother, Sandy 
Sawyer's mother brought her a birthday gift on Saturday, May 2nd. Yes, that's right. And it was a red blouse. And she had it on that day. Yeah, there's an endless... And, and, and the gentleman jumping up and down in the blood with the flag was Tom Miller. Was who? His name was Tom Miller, no relation Miller. to Jeff Miller. Okay, good. And he dipped the flag in Jeff's blood and splattered it around all the people standing next to him because he wanted it to be real for them. And two years later, he was killed in an automobile accident. He was killed how? In an automobile accident in Kentucky. Oh, oh. There was actually a sequence of pictures that I just pulled the one. The car crashed in a napkin uh, from several times. So the, the, the caption did not identify the gentleman. I'm sorry, I know a lot because I was there. shooters were there too, but yeah, I get it. I get it, and I know that you do, and thank you for that very much. Uh, who else? Yes, over here. Is there any way to get a copy of what you gave us today? Um, if you talk to me afterward, I'll see what I can do. Yeah. Also, our other satellite campuses having these kinds yes, of things. Yes, the university with its very full embrace now of the 50th anniversary uh, is sponsoring at least 60 events on the Kent campus and each of the regionals is doing a series of events too. How are those being advertised? Well, I'll tell you, if you go to the Kent State overall website, uh, there are constant updates as well as a standing list of uh, events in Kent. And I know ours are on our website, so I presume that if you go to the Stark website or any of the others, uh, you'll find that information as well. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Were the soldiers ever publicly identified? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, every shooter, I think, is known. Uh, but literally, there's been no justice. Once that federal judge uh, dismissed charges in the middle of the trial without anything going to the jury. That protects them now for the rest of their lives. Even for Lavros, Judge Oh, oh Lavros, yes, that's right, uh-huh. So, people used to say back in those days, no justice, just us. And there was technically a second judge. Yes, there was. That, yes, there was, right. There were lots of fabrications at the time. I kind of uh, tried to avoid them because I don't see the point in re repeating, you know, utter falsehood. But of course, you know, the whole argument that the guard was, uh, uh, you know, endangered which again, a lot of the physical changes that have gone on since May 4th uh, only add credence to those lies and distortions. But the FBI report uh, systematically takes m almost all of those things apart. Uh, other questions, what about Kent State students we haven't heard from? And I thought it was just in my classes. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, when the soldiers uh, kind of like ushered or, or directed the, the protesters and, and even the, the um, students that were just leaving their classes that had nothing to do with the protest, when they were directed down that hill, we can see in that picture, wasn't there a fence line that they were directed towards and they were found uh, out? Well, there's the one scene the where Alan Canfor is waving that flag. The guardsmen are on the football practice field at that point. And you will observe that will have observed there was a great distance, and uh, some of them knelt and aimed their rifles at Allen, some at people unknown. Many of them right at the parking lot where a few minutes later everybody fell, and then they proceeded up the hill and that time turned around in earnest and did it. So the fence you're seeing has to do with the football uh, practice field.
You know, I talked a little bit about the reaction on campuses around the country, and uh, Brad did kind of touch on a, uh, a moment that I didn't really get to in my talk, but immediately following the shootings, the students present were outraged and livid. You see some of that in a, the picture of the guy jumping up and down. But, as Brad said, they were ready to throw their bodies at the bullets and the bayonets and whatever it took, and there really truly is a single hero uh, from that day, and it's uh, Professor Glenn Frank who really talked everybody down and said, that's it, we don't want a further bloodbath. And he was a respected uh, member of the faculty and people listened to him, and uh, there's no question that he saved a lot of lives that day. Yeah. Listen to the audio of that day, I've asked people a few times. Um, you can hear him calming the crowd and trying to talk to the crowd. And it's weird as a student, kind of, the perception you have, but then as a faculty member, you know, I, I can't even for a moment then imagine. Yeah, yeah. But it's so powerful. If you can't go back and listen, I'd encourage people to go and, sure. and do that. Yes. Uh, I was there on that Monday also, and I, I do believe that uh, one of the shots, uh, they found a hole in the eighth floor of the Tri Towers through a window or uh, and quite a ways away, so somebody conceivably could have been looking out the window from the eighth floor of that dormitory and, and got shot, so, yeah. so it, was, it was pretty random. Yeah, that's right, and uh, of course the last photograph that was up when I was talking is a photograph of the sculpture in front of Taylor Hall with a bullet hole in it. Uh, you would have seen that, I didn't see it because I was looking your way, but uh, yeah, I mean they were just spraying. Yes, please. I'm just wondering um, if there was something that was driving the university to have such a lack of uh, <coughs> empathy and be so insensitive what had happened, um, to not kind of come together and, you know, with the whole gymnasium thing, just kind of pushing it under the rug. When it seems well, like I want to try to answer that as succinctly as I can. I really do love Mother Kent State, <laughs> even though it didn't protect people that day by any means, and even though everything I've written to you is an exact or read to you as an exact fact. But I read to you the statements of the national political leaders, Nixon, Reagan, Rhodes, and over the years, long before I ever came to this campus, even when I was a teaching assistant at Michigan State, I would run into young people who felt that they somehow missed something because they weren't around for the 60s, which by the way always means like late 60s and the first half of the 70s, just FYI. Uh, some of the most backward accounts of May 4th uh, talk about how it marked the end of a decade and stuff, rubbish, nonsense. Uh, but, to be sure, the political leaders at Kent State or most any other university uh, were largely in line with people like Nixon and Reagan and Agnew. I didn't tell you that in the immediate days following uh, the shootings, poll of Americans found some outrageous percent, I think it might have even been 
uh, 48 or 58, I should have looked it up, uh, of the American people said they stood with the guard. Um, in Kent, people were saying uh, guard for uh, student zero. Many, many, many people uh, were saying that they should have uh, killed more. Um, a guy in a southern state in a prominent position, I can't remember right now what it was, said that if a guardsman had fired on my daughter and she was uh, demonstrating on her campus, I would invite him home for supper. Uh, so, what I'm getting at when I say a lot of young people I've known through the years have felt like they've missed the boat, uh, I'm not sure. Because when we look back at history and you see those millions of people in the streets demonstrating against Vietnam, it's one thing, it's like a baseball game. You look at it at the end and you see, oh boy, that fourth in inning was decisive. But boy, at the time, uh, everyone was paying a price for objecting to the war in the way they did. And then really, Kent State becomes this enormous moment that shifted the tide. There's no question about that. No question about that. So. It was typical of the uh, political leadership uh, in office at the time. And um, on down the line, down to the you know, lower level people in mayorships and university presidencies and so forth. You know, all of you young people are the recipients of a massive kind of uh, cultural awakening, even if you want to call it that, uh, that occurred around the things, some of the things that Brad had up there and you know, that period. The way you dress, the way you talk, profoundly influenced by people who really had to undergo some stuff, to put it politely, uh, to bring a lot of that about. And a lot of the stuff of that period of time was presented to us as though the biggest contradiction in society uh, was between, between generations. That's a pretty weak argument. But the fact of the matter is that the entrenched older generations uh, did were really part and parcel of the kind of sentiments expressed by Rhodes and Reagan and those people and so on. So Kent State, really what I'm saying, in terms of its officialdom, it was pretty stupid. A more worldly kind of um, administration would have undoubtedly been kinder, but they also weren't way outside the norm of, uh, of political opinion at the top of the heap in this country at that time. If that answers your question. It was kind of on the spot. You know, when you think about what was being blamed on the university, it was the radicalization of young people. Uh, and so a university president, once he knows who his donors are, he knows who his alumni are, he knows where his support is going to be to maintain the, the, the status of the university in a very competitive, you know, educational world. So who are you going to side with? And it, essentially, you're going to side with the establishment.
50 years ago, I was in this branch campus of Kent State. And uh, when that happened on May 4th, we were all sitting in class, not in this building, because it wasn't here then, but in the, the rooms that were here. Um, and we didn't know what was gonna happen. We didn't know what was going on. But later on that day, the police came. We were all ordered out of the building and we were escorted by the police. Everyone in this building was escorted out to their cars, one room at a time. And then we did not have classes for that week. But starting the next Monday, we came back and had our classes as usual. Oh, uh, yeah, again, it was six weeks, yeah. Yeah. And by the way, Brad mentioned, Dr. Kiefer mentioned, uh, we were on uh, quarters in those days. So really, uh, in the spring of 1970, classes weren't going to get out until sometime in June. take like two more questions uh, yes not so much a question but somebody asked the question earlier if the information for tonight uh, would be provided um, this event and all of the other events um, forthcoming uh, were, are, are being recorded and will be shared on our campus YouTube channel and some of the other selected events will be live streamed um, so if you're unable to attend that particular evening um, we will be streaming it also on our uh, YouTube channel with links um, through our social media channels. So check Facebook, Twitter, and uh, our LinkedIn page for links uh, to the YouTube channel with uh, all the recorded things. Probably in a day or two, we'll have tonight's up. So yeah, you can find it all there. Thanks Jason, thank you. Maybe that'll progress here. Okay, uh, question. Going once, twice, thrice. Thank you all very much. Take care.